Hello, everybody. Welcome to the American Dream. Today we have newly elected state senator Brendan Crichton. Brendan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you having me. Yep, and congratulations on your election. Thanks a lot. Excited to be here. Okay. So, what are you doing now? So, we, we got elected on March 6th, sworn in on March 7th, and then got right to work. Um, I was uh, recently appointed to, to my committees. So, right. what, one of the differences between the House and the Senate is uh, automatically you're, you're a chairman of a committee, which gives you a lot of uh, influence in terms of the policy making process. So, I was appointed to the chair of municipalities and regional government, uh, which, you know, as a former city councilor, certainly appreciate, you know, the, the yeah, needs of sure. local government. It'll be exciting Smart to work pick. on yeah. some of those issues and with a bunch of uh, upcoming town meetings where, you know, charter changes and things like that will be considered all of a, a great opportunity to, to work with our committee staff, even like later in the legislative process. Uh, additionally, was able to get uh, vice chair of the housing committee which, as you know, housing is a, a crucial issue both inland and across Massachusetts, really. We're really facing a crisis, so uh, I'm excited to work on those uh, bills. And then the Transportation Committee, which you know, Senator Brigitte was chair of, and I, I had a chance to work for uh, as a staffer at the Senate, uh, and also economic development, uh, and uh, lastly, substance abuse and mental health. So really all, all issues that Key are very issues. much pressing. So uh, it's exciting, but we're also at the end of our legislative session. Uh, it wraps up on July 31st. We have our, our budget coming up, which is, uh, you know, takes up a lot of the, the focus and energy. And then a few key bills, like I mentioned, housing, I think also an economic development bill teed up. We're going to hopefully do some education and environmental stuff as What's well. What's the economic development bill about? So it does, uh, it's a lot of, uh, of, money towards programs that have proven to be successful, like the MassWorks program, which in Lynn, Lynn has taken advantage of in a, a few different um, areas. We've, uh, it's basically infrastructure funding to encourage uh, development. So we have some of the, we've used that uh, on the waterfront in the past, but statewide it's really popular because it gives, you know, cities, gateway cities like Lynn, a little bit more leverage to promote development. And there are a ton of other programs. It's more of a money bill, the economic development bill, but there's a great program that's helped out uh, vocational and technical schools buy capital equipment, and tech has taken advantage of that. Um, and hopefully, this will, you know, refunding this will give them more opportunities for grant awards in the future. I'd like to use this show as a primer on how the state senate works, okay. so we can educate people. <laughs> Well, my wife works in the Senate too, so she can oh, correct she all. She's oh. at the Senate clerk's <laughs> office, so she'll correct me if I mess up any of the procedures. Oh, you're not mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> So how, how many communities do you represent? So right now I represent six, six communities, Lynn, Linfield, Marblehead, Nahant, Saugus, and Swampscott. So it's four times the, the size of the district that I had right. over in the House. Um, so just as a, for the folks at home, uh, 160 House members, 40 state senators. So do you refer to the Senate as the upper chamber? I, I won't make that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, Tom McGee used to say that his father would say the only reason they call it the upper chamber is because it was originally upstairs above. Um, so certainly nothing to do with our uh, yeah, prestige or ability. I'm just fooling. Yeah, up. but the house. I still see all you know my house friends and house Good. colleagues, and you know I think it's it's helpful having worked uh, over course. in the house very recently. Uh, there's a perception out there, you know, uh, real or otherwise, that you know the branches branches don't always you know work well together, but. Uh, my experience has been that you know we communicate effectively, and, and I'm hoping to to help with that that dialogue. Have you had a tell us how the Senate works? What's a so um, you pass a law? How do you pass a law? So we're, like I said, we're, we're pretty late in the process. So I guess I'll start. If this was the beginning of a term, right? Um, there's a a process to to file bills. So. Every year, there are you know six, seven thousand bills a bill filed. Is a proposed law. Yeah, a proposed law. Sorry. And very few of those actually make it and in, in become law. And it's, it's a very, it can be a slow process. It can be a very deliberative process. And it's mostly due to the, the vetting. And I think I mean, when something becomes a law, it's a, it's a serious deal. So I would file a bill. Um, and I mean, it's a very long process. So I don't want to take up the whole show. But essentially, no, no, it would go no. be referred to a committee, such right. as one of the committees we talked about. They will review that. They'll have public hearings, which you know are posted online. People can track their 
bill. We have some college students that I filed a bill for that, you know, regularly keeping up with. They actually came and testified before the committee. Um, so you can come in, you can weigh in through email, through phone calls, through actually testifying before the committee. That committee will then make a decision more often if the bill passes favorably, which typically over that first year, it'll take a year or so before a lot of the bills are coming out, then it will likely go to another committee. Um, eventually, if you are able to get through the committee process, your bill will come to either the House or the Senate floor, depending on whether it's a House or Senate bill. It's just kind of technical right. stuff. And then um, you know, each branch considers the, the bill a few different times as a process there. You know, you go through the different First readings reading. of the bill. Yeah, yeah. you know, I'm talking to an old senator. <laughs> no, no, but you're talking to the So um, <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, once the House and the Senate pass the bill to be engrossed, um, it will, will go to the, uh, to the governor for his signature. And he can either amend it, he can veto it, or he, or he can sign it. Uh, if he vetoes it, what does, what does it take to override his veto? So it would be a two-thirds vote of, of both bodies. Um, so recently I, I had a bill that was amended by the governor and vetoed by the governor, and uh, it was kind of a, a nice introduction to the legislative process. So we were able to, to pass a bill, you know, was going to be into law. It was a part of a bigger package, uh, but he sent the bill back with amendments, essentially. It changed the bill considerably. Uh, we then rejected those amendments, submitted our original language, went back to the governor for his signature. So I'm thinking, you know, all right, we're in a good spot. Is he really going to come back at us again and make us, like, clearly this is the second time we voted this. Right. The legislature has made its, you know, made its point. He ends up vetoing it, comes back, and to get the two-thirds vote, it really has to that be something non-controversial. Really, yeah. yeah, non um, so long story short, we, we did not override the veto. We chose to sit back down with his team, Secretary Ash and other folks, and now we're at the point where we've come up with compromised language, which doesn't take away right. from the principle of the bill. And, you know, we worked with them. So it's actually a, a good example of the process oh, working, works, how yeah. it's supposed to work. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I'm not, we're not at the finish line yet. I'm still trying to find the right vehicle, but hopefully by the end of session we'll have a, a bill made into law. So, Have you filed any legislation since you've been in the Senate? So not since I've been in, but there were three bills, uh, all local actually, that we had filed um, right before I left in the House. So we had, okay. the, so we had to work on it. I mean, Representative Cahill, Ehrlich and Wong, and myself had to work on a few different um, pieces. Um, so we had the, we have some legislation for the waterfront to to some easement stuff. These are all not all that interesting bills. The armory is being tr transferred, uh, hopefully to Lynn Housing Authority, and then also the city needed authorization to borrow to write their finances. Um, yeah. So that was a that was probably the trickiest. Good legislation. Yeah, I mean, we needed it. It oh, yeah. would be facing. Yeah. I was going to get to money. But Receive, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about money in. What's going to happen uh, to the Omri? So um, I'm not sure if, if all the programming has been specified, but it's going to be uh, some veterans housing and also um, programs, assistance for, for veterans. So it's been, it's, you know, it needs significant uh, I was, capital improvements. Yeah. Um, so we're confident that the housing I authority can get it done. I was in the National Guard. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. So, you, yeah, I've... I got my driver's license there. That's about my yeah. only connection. So, uh, so um, let's talk about money. Uh, Mayor McGee has just obtained this bill that you talked about, mm -hmm. and, and that puts him on an even keel for now. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that's all going to fly? Not that bill, but yeah. the, the money thing. It's, it's really challenging. So, yeah. um, I mean, this keeps, us, keeps the ship afloat uh, for a little while. But we really need to increase our revenues and expand our tax base if we're going to, to keep going this way. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the waterfront or some other, um, you know, available or vacant properties, we really need to to have some economic Is development. Is that the primary source? I think, think so. For cities and towns, really, property uh, taxes are their primary source, other than state aid. But, I mean, do you think the waterfront would be the primary source for Lynn? Uh, it would be enough to... To help offset it, but we're still, we're still, there are a lot of challenges, and oh, I won't I know, say that yeah. you know we're not alone. It's um, not an easy job. No, cities and towns across the state, the edu the cost of healthcare, the cost of um, education have grown. Um, 
I will use this to seg segue into the education because it is a, a okay. big part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, back in 1993, there was you know education reforms uh, done. They established the Chapter 70 program. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, which was very well intentioned, and at the time, it seemed to provide you know municipalities the the resources they needed to you know give good education. And Massachusetts is you know ranks some of the Number highest. One yeah. In the country. And and across the world, we're very respectable. But at the same point, we're not doing all that we can. And the the state aid that's come in um, hasn't reflected the costs, you know, in terms of some of the health care ends, the um, ELL students, uh, special needs students. So there was a, a foundation budget review commission that happened and that occurred in 2015. And um, they, the, sorry, the report. Um, was finished in 2015, and it realized that we're underestimating the cost of education across the state to the tune of one to two billion dollars. Mm. So, um, you know, when you look at some of the financial difficulties in you know cities like Lynn and other gateway cities are facing it, there's a, a, a lot. It's a lot to do with I think education. Um, so uh, I'm a supportive of a bill that hopefully will get through. Question at the end of the day is where does the money come from? Um, to hard. fund it. So there, there's a ballot uh, initiative, as you're, you're aware of, the fair share amendment. Oh, oh, yeah. um, so That's the 4% deal. surtax on those earning, not, not just millionaires, people that earn more than a million dollars a year. Um, and that, would, that revenue created from that would be dedicated to education and transportation, two of the areas of, I think, critical need. Do you think that legislation will pass? I, if, if it goes to the ballot, I think it will pass overwhelmingly. Um, there are two um, kind of scary parts about it. One, that it's, it's being considered in the court system now whether or not it's even allowed to go to the ballot. There's some issues on constitutionality there. Um, so we're waiting that decision. It may not even end well, up on the does ballot. Does this amend the Constitution, <coughs> the state Constitution? Yeah, so there's... Um, so You're not allowed to really change the uh, the income tax. It's it's pretty much set in in the constitution. So this would allow us to to add Unless that surtax. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's that what this does? Yeah. Um, and then the other threat is the uh, there's a ballot initiative to uh, decrease the sales tax. So that's basically the opponents of the the. The millionaires tax or the fair share amendment have said, "All right, if you're going to increase taxes there, we want to decrease taxes here." Um, so the one to two billion dollars, or it's closer to two billion dollars worth of savings, if that if both pass, you're going to be back at the same it's a wash. point. It's a wash, exactly. Oh. So uh, I mean, I hope the, the the folks at home will will pay attention to the campaign as it comes forward. As much as I want a more progressive system, and you know, the sales tax is a more regressive tax. Wiping away those th that revenue um, would be very you know costly to the state. We wouldn't be able to make these improvements. Who, who's going to oppose the sales tax proposal? I think it, it's an, it's going to be a, a campaign to educate folks out there to, right. that the the funding that we'll lose um, should the sales tax go down, it's really going to crush any of the the money we we're going to gain from the other. So if you want to improve your education and transportation system, yeah. and we believe this is a, a fair way to do it, uh, I would vote you know, yes in favor of the fair share and then no to the reduction. But there'll be more. I mean, this is a few months away. And right. It's, it's on the ballot this year? Yeah, it'll be on the ballot in the fall, so in November. Um, but there's also, I, I should mention, that, you know, there are a few other ballot initiatives. There's a, a, a minimum wage raise to $15 an hour over the course of a few years, as well as uh, paid family leave, which would allow folks, you know, they just have a, a baby or their medical needs to to have paid time um, How much off to time? do that. Yeah. I don't want to mess it <laughs> I, oh, I, okay. I, I should just have uh, did Sorry, a ref refresher uh, yeah, that's okay. yeah. before, but... Um, it, there, those are all good questions. There is a legislative effort to just to come up with a compromise um, in the legislature rather than have it go to the ballot, uh, with the sense that you know it'll be a little bit more of a deliberative action there where we can actually debate the issue. Uh, so we'll, that's more of a stay tuned to see if we can help come to some compromise. What's the deadline before it goes on the ballot? Uh, so I think so. If we, July 31st would be the deadline of us to pass a law. Um, and I think if we were to pass a law that both sides found amenable, then they would, you know, pull back. Um, Who proposed? The 
Um, so there's um, th there's a coalition of folks that, that are working on it. So it's a you know you need wide them range. To of, sign off on your I think they, they they're part of the conversations. Okay. Um, but you know, I, a lot of that's being done at as I mentioned before the committee level, and uh, I'm not on that committee, so I don't want to speak too uh, too much out of turn. Yeah. Uh, but two other commissions that I failed to mention earlier that I just got appointed to uh, the Met Metropolitan Beaches Commission, which um, I had been a member on the House side, but now I'm the, the chairman. Um, and obviously this district has a tremendous coastline, and in particular the, the DCR on beaches at Lynn and Hunt Beach and Kings Beach. Um, I was chairman of Urban Affairs when I was in the Senate. And that committee control all MDC Oh, no funding. kidding. Yeah. Oh, so you, you have some experience yeah, with the... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So what are you doing with that commi commission? So, it's a commission, um, not a committee. It's right? a commission, so you know we can make recommendations, and I, I certainly can propose legislation or, or budget amendments. Right. Um, I mean, it's geared mostly towards increasing access and um, promoting <clears throat> our beaches. So there, I mean, there's some of right. our, our strongest assets. Um, Lynn Beach has been in great shape. Oh, it's, it's, Thank you, Bobby Tucker, yeah, Eddie Bob, Lynch, I, and all those guys. I so. was with Bob yesterday down um, checking out the surveying the, the storm damage uh, down oh, okay. there, which yeah. uh, it, it was hit hard. So we're yeah. going to need to find money to, to make those repairs. But also, it's, I mean, the algae issue that comes up, it's something right. that comes up every year, making it's sure. It's coming up every year since 1919. It, it has. And for me, the, uh, I mean, That's it's not less. when I was in the Senate. No. <laughs> It's less of an issue for the, at this point, on the, on the smell, but for the access piece. If you right. go down to the beach, people are coming from all over to come to Lynn to go to the beach, and you have a large chunk of it that's inaccessible. Did you ever go there when you were a kid? I did. We went there, we went there did a lot. You, you just moved around it, right? Yeah. I, I mean, not, not that I recommend it, but... I can't remember you, the yeah. specific days, but I, I mean, I was aware of it back then. And yeah. then we have another challenging issue on the Kings Beach side, which is a Stacy Brook that um, yeah. comes out right at the Swampskit Lynn line, which uh, creates you know water quality that's not acceptable for swimming right. at certain times. It so, comes from sewer runoff? Yeah, it's sewer, it's sewer runoff, um, you know, some illegal tie-ins. We're studying the issue now. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have some recommendations Try soon. Try to clean there. up the water. That's the thing. So yeah. if we're going to have, you know, a few hundred yards of beach inaccessible because of the algae, right. um, and people are now flocking to the tell Kings Beach kids, side. Tell more. your kids not to plant that yeah. little river. Oh, there. no, yeah. they have to. I and mean, that's yeah. actually a serious, right. serious concern. Right. Um, I will flag one thing for the folks at home that, you know, are active with, you know, whether it's youth programs or neighborhood groups. Um, there's a $250,000 uh, grant program that uh, the Metropolitan Beaches Commission, in partnership with Save the Harbor, Save the Bay, just put out. Um, if folks are interested, please contact my office. Um, so it's more for local groups, not for individuals, but it creates free programming down the beach. Um, so some, you know, there's been different arts festivals, there's been movies on the beach, yeah. you know, there's a ton of different things well, to bring activity, people back down. Yeah. It's a great spot. Yeah, great. And then um, one other thing, I'm, I'm rambling here no, as no, politicians. No, no. No, this, are, is what, this is what we so want to hear. The, the other commission that I was named chair of, is the uh, after school and out of school time commission and um, big deal? Yeah, it's it's huge and it's always been a big deal. When you think about when the the school day ends and that bell rings, you know well, what do you do with exactly? The kids? Uh, what do they do if they don't have anything to do? With exactly. It? So um, that's a big big deal. It's huge. Again, comes with a price tag, but yeah. uh, I think the the commission will come up with some recommendations that hopefully next, you know, when in January, God willing, I get reelected. We can file some legislation that will hopefully um, help uh, increase access because it's huge waiting lists. And Lynn's program is doing an amazing job, but yeah, there's still YMC, kids. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Y, Boys and Girls, Girls Inc., yeah. Campfire, all great programs, but more is needed. So, yeah. what? What? Uh, how, how many bills did you say are filed every year? About seven thousand. I threw out seven thousand, but uh, that's I've been saying these estimates, you know, for a couple right. years. Yeah, roughly. But almost all of them have a price tag. Yeah, and that's it's hard. So there, there's so many things we want to do uh, as a, a legislature and as a commonwealth. But how do you prioritize? Well, being a you know relatively you know rank and file member, I can advocate strongly for you know all of these. Um, so we're meeting now for our, our budget that will come up what in May. What does that mean? Does that mean later on you have seniority? Or just, uh, you know, well, then you have you to make the real decision. The it, it's like a, <laughs> you know, a, a budget at your house, right? I mean, you, you yeah. can only have a, yeah. a finite amount of resources. But I think it's important, 
even with that finite amount, that advocates and people that benefit from these projects continue to call us and 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 advocate for we it. Do. Uh, because, That's you know, good. who knows how revenues are going to play out. I mean, right now we're seeing surpluses and, you know, that could change. But um, the programs need to have a face. And when people come to the office and they tell their story or if I visit them in the district and I see something, you know, face to face, it really does compel your legislator to, to act and to, it gives them a better sense of the story, which then we can take uh, to our, our leadership and, you know, the ways well, and means. I see you at nonprofit meetings yeah. and you stay which is pretty, pretty <laughs> as, impressive uh, oh thank you a lot of people don't uh, as much as we, as much as we yeah, can as, i know as much yeah. as you can but the people in the nonprofits appreciate it yeah the, that gives you a better understanding of what's going yeah. on and they're on the front line so who, who better oh, to talk yeah. to than that uh let's go back to money for a minute mm -hmm. we, how could you get money to lend i mean it basically increased local aid yeah, so exactly. every year there'll be a top priority for, I mean, any legislators when we sit down right. with the budget is we want to maximize the local aid. Um, the economic development end that I touched upon, you know, those are, you know, millions of dollars. And you don't really have any, as a state senator, you don't really have any input into that, do you? Unless you, unless they're looking for... <laughs> On the um, on the economic development side, I don't know how every community works, but uh, for Lynn at least, uh, even when I was on the council, you work with your state delegation. So we, we've been at all the the meetings on the waterfront or um, or the downtown, and I don't know if it's kind of a if it's a unique form, uh, but we get along well with I think both our federal and local players. Right. So right. I think it helps to have us at the table. I mean, I don't want to go into the details of the meetings, but we're, Every week we're at, you know, a handful of economic development specific meetings. Um, and Secretary Ash has been, you know, uh, has had an open door and he's the economic development chief for the state. So uh, progress is slow, but we're hopeful that... Do you see progress, though? I do. Um, cool. And there's bumps, I mean, there's been a couple of bumps recently I won't get into, but no, we'll... Um, we, we keep working, and I, I think we're going to have some good news, you know, coming to, to land in the near future and see some more shovels on the ground. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you've heard about it a lot in the past, but it's you start these economic development projects, and you, you have an original, you know, a timeline, initial timeline, right. and inevitably it, it gets bumped, you know, down. Yeah. I will see, you know, the Washington Street Gateway project. That's I drive by it every day, and that's coming along really well. Now, that's Jeff Crosby had a lot to do with that. Oh, he was huge. That, that's that's national union money. Yeah, coming to land. That's the primary source, I think. Yeah, they were. They the was housing a, authority. Is that also partnership a that they time, yeah. that they had. Um, and I will say, you know, the 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 local officials on the zoning changes and you know predecessors in office, Steve Wallace, Bob Finnell, yeah, those guys, and it was a good team effort. But you're right, the uh, and that was kind of unique to have. Uh, labor at the table, and it's a great, great project. They initiated the project. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a great project. And Charlie Gate has been uh, tremendous on it. Right, and, right. Um, I said the housing authority. So we'd like, um, you know, to see more more of that. I want more shovels right. in the ground. So. Right. Um, and on the housing end, just generally, I mean, Massachusetts now is the third most expensive place to, to live in the well, country. You want to see more shovels in the ground. What are the prospects for getting other people to do what the labor unions did and the housing authorities? And housing authorities all over the city. Yeah. I mean, they do what they can. But how so, do you get non-state yeah. or federal money into the city? So on the, the labor side, I don't know enough about how they got to that point. I don't know if there's an appetite on there and to do another project like that. I'm sure they would have willing partners. Yeah. Uh, as far as just private interests, so right. outside That's without about, without yeah. us rolling out you know the red carpet, uh, um, or without offering things for people to come, I think changing um, a lot of our previous policies. So we had zoning that just didn't make sense for a long time. It was only a few years ago that we changed that, allowing certain things that we want by right. You did that before you left the council, right? I did, and it was yeah. a you know again a big collaboration, um, and it can definitely still be fine tuned. Like I'm not a oh, expert yeah. city planner by any means, but at least we decided here's what we want to see, and now people can do it by right, which saves the developers one. It just gives them reassurance that they're not going to come in and be held up by you know a city council or a city you know make it not worth their while. So right. if you want to build housing in certain parts of the city where we want housing, you're able to come in. 
And obviously there's still building standards and all that, but you can at least have that use by right. So what's holding up developers? From well, I think there's, I mean, I think it's, it's a timely, I mean, we have the gear plant, so that's a thousand units there that they, oh, they've been a thousand plus permitted for. You have 348. What's the status of that? So I just <laughs> driving by and I was, had my eye on the road, of course, but I was glancing. I mean, they're doing a ton of work <laughs> over there um, and they're going through, I think, some of the local permitting um, end of things, but they're moving ahead. So that's uh, going to fly. I believe so, but I don't want to pull my foot, my, my okay. shoe or foot right. in my mouth, whatever the saying is. Um, the across the way at the Beacon Chevrolet or the North Harbor site, we, uh, you know, have gotten, you know, as close as anyone has to the finish line for 348 units there. And the big part of that project for, for me and for others is restoring access to the waterfront. So on the Linshore Drive side, we have beautiful Red Rock Park and all that space to walk. But on the Linway side, other than, um, you know, Seaport Landing and um, Essex Hydro Park there, you have very limited space for folks and there's not a ton of connectivity. We feel that the developer has to buy you know, by law, create a boardwalk and connectivity which will connect Good. all the way down to the commuter ferry. Well, that's great. In the, the work that we've seen so far done on it, it would be, it's, it's more of a park and a, a destination for people to go and have picnics and just enjoy a beautiful waterfront experience. Yeah. So public access is huge for any of these developments. Of and of course, the developers don't want some of that stuff. Right? It no, but it impacts on their budget. It does, but um, again, that's where you know I think we came in as a state, and we can you know see if there are yeah. grant programs that can help them out. And the state came up big with um, some help. We're, we have actually, uh, you know, one of the bills that I mentioned earlier would allow them to do certain things, um, you know, in terms of the park, and um, we all, we're all working together. Good. Uh, I'm sorry, but this went by very fast. That's it? <laughs> We're going to have to wrap it up. We have to do a two-pod series here. Jeez. Uh, I'll, I'll happily. Yeah. I'm sorry I, I rambled no, no, on. No, no, Don't be okay. silly. That's what I wanted you to do. Okay. I, I, and I'll get, get you back again. You're one okay. of our favorite guests. Oh, and thank you. I, let me be a you regular. You get a lot of information. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah. And thanks yeah. for providing this public service for the city. Oh, I have a lot of fun, too. Yeah. Among your other <laughs> missions. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, we'll see you again. Good luck. Thank and, you so uh, much. Any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I would just suggest that folks reach out to us on any issue. Oftentimes people don't know that at the State House, just because we're in Boston, doesn't mean that we're not you know, accessible. I'll take a coffee meeting with anybody anytime. Who's, your, who's on your staff? I so uh, my chief of staff is DJ Napolitano. Right. He's worked Great in the guy. Senate for a long Great time. Guy. Good guy. Uh, my uh, legislative director is John Tebow. We just yep. came over from the Housing Authority. Also, you have all good people. Oh, thank you. Me, so. Sherry Warrington is my deputy chief of staff. She worked for Senator McGee prior. And then Dulce Gonzalez is my legislative aide, and she came with me from over in the House where she was my aide. Great talent. And job can't get done without a staff, so thank you, staff, if you're watching. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks so, a lot. Stick around for one minute yeah. just so we wrap.